Thank you, gentlemen. All right. We are going to talk about, let's see, what are we going to talk about tonight? If you need, it, if you need to, to put a heading on this, let's call it positive self-control. Continuing our, in our series this summer of trying to be positive after all this negativity we've gone through, we're going to try to start to learn how to look for uh, the positive things in life, the positive things that God has for us. In 1 Corinthians 13, 11, it reads, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. I'm going to tell you right now, start off for you to write this down. First, there are five marks of immaturity. The first mark is an inability to receive criticism. An inability to receive criticism is the first one. Second is being slow to forgive and quick to blame. Being slow to forgive and quick to blame is the second. Third, the inability to adapt to difficult circumstances. Again, the third one was the inability to adapt to difficult circumstances. <clears throat> the fourth is refusal to accept your own responsibilities. Fourth again is refusal to accept your own responsibilities. And the fifth is, is a desire to have your own needs met first. Again, the fifth is a desire to have your own needs met first. And really, if we think about it, maybe that's the, that, that fifth one's the one that sums the whole thing up. Because the grown-up baby says, me first, you second. Amen. That may sound familiar to some of you guys. Because I think we've all been there, we've all done that. Some of us are still there, some of us are still doing that, unfortunately. Amen. <clears throat> And maybe you're that guy that's doing it still. But you need to remember something. Not every baby wears pampers. If you've seen the King Baby video, which I'm sure you all have, except maybe one guy, you know that not all babies wear pampers. Some of them actually dress in three-piece suits and make sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year. And there's still a bunch of babies. Some of them are in this program some of them are outside of this program. The bottom line is, gentlemen, you're here not to just deal with your drug or alcohol addiction or whatever other addiction you have. You're here because you need to grow up. Now, to some of you, that's a hard pill to swallow. And maybe you've even heard that from parents or other loved ones, significant others, who have said you need to grow up. And of course, because you are so mature, you said, oh, thank you. I so much appreciate that information. I will start to change immediately. Yeah. <laughs> well, what you did was, you stomped your feet, you whined and cried, and you blamed everybody else for your problems. 
The bottom line is we can't blame anybody else for our problems. We can only blame ourselves. Okay? And once we get that and understand that, then you're going to truly start to mature. <clears throat> what makes the difference between winners and losers is this. A winner has a positive self-control. A winner realizes they're 100% responsible for their own lives. It doesn't mean that it's going, your life is going to be easy or cushy or whatever. It just means that you understand you alone, 100%, are responsible for your life. Your mama didn't do it to you. Your daddy didn't do it to you. The rough conditions you grew up didn't do it to you. The COVID-19 didn't do it to you. <clears throat> the judge didn't do it to you. The prosecuting attorney didn't do it to you. You did it to you. You alone put yourself in the predicaments that you have found yourself in. We can't blame Satan. Well, we can, but I won't allow it. Because half the time Satan isn't the one that's done it. I understand demonic presence and I understand things like that, but the bottom line is in this room, most of us have gotten ourselves in the position we're in because we, no one else, has done it to ourselves. We made the decision to do such and such. We made the decision to do drugs. We made the decision after we've had numerous opportunities to get healthy and straight again and, re and in recovery, we have made those decisions again to start up in that addiction. We. Nobody else did it to you. Unless there might be that one or two people out there that have been force-fed drugs. Other than that, and I'll be honest with you, in, in, in the 40 years I've been doing this, I've only met one person that that actually happened to. And even that I'm a little questionable on. I can't, I can't verify it. But they were pretty convincing. But that's the only one per one person in 40 years of dealing with drug addiction and alcoholism have I found that somebody was actually tied up and forced fed drugs, and that's how they started. Other than that, they never did a drug in their life. What I'm saying is that it's not I'm not I'm not trying to condemn you because you've done this. What I'm trying to do is to get you to understand that until you receive this, until you become responsible for what you alone are, have done to your own selves, you will never mature, you will never grow up, you will never kick the habit. I know that's a harsh statement, but I really believe that. Or if you do happen to kick one habit, you'll pick up another one. You'll just substitute one addiction for another. But like I said, winners have positive self-control. Winners understand 100% that their, 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 responsibility, their lives alone are, are their responsibility. Winners have the power to take control of their lives. You in this room right now who are trying to take control of your lives are winners. Winners have the power to not only take control of their lives, but have the power to take control of their, their thinking and their physical being. I want to be real honest with you tonight. I get so sick and tired of hearing about people when you ask them, why did you go and what, what happened that you had to get you relapsed? What, and people tell me, I don't know. I don't know, you're full of garbage. You know. Amen. Take responsibility for what you know. Man up. Understand, gentlemen, and this is probably going to be a very short teaching, but understand this. It's your life. You need to own it. I can't do it for you. Leslie can't do it for you. Jonathan can't do it for you. None of us can do it for you. I can do it for one person and one person only. That's me. You heard a little bit of, of Jonathan's testimony tonight. At Circle Up, he testified only he could take responsibility for his life 
and do what he felt God was telling them to do. Hey, life is stressful. I got it. Especially this year, 2020. It's been extremely uh, stressful. What we have to do, with, what we have to do if, if we're going to mature is we need to learn how to respond and adapt more successfully. It's not a matter of if, if we're going to have hard times. You're going to have hard times. It's not a matter of whether, whether these things are going to come at us or not. They're going to come at us. What matters is not what happens. That's not what really counts. What matters is, is how we deal with it. If you want to live in some kind of some kind of a, a bubble, as they call it now, with all those NBA, NHL, all everybody's living in a bubble. I think we're the only ones not living in a bubble. But if you want to live in some kind of bubble, that's great. Live in the bubble, man. But when you fail. Don't blame everybody else for your failure because you've tried to live in some kind of little bubble, secluded from, from the world, secluded from trying to, to, to deal with things. <clears throat> it's funny, I was, I was talking to one of the staff today and, and we just talked about the COVID and stuff and something he heard uh, some commentator or news person say, or I don't know where he heard it, but they would, they, he was telling me what, what he heard was, he said, you know, somebody said that we're probably going to have COVID forever now. Now that it's here, we're going to have COVID. We're going to have, the virus is going to be here. Just like influenza, just like all these other things. It doesn't go away. We just learn how to combat it, but it doesn't go away. So we're going to have it. Now, whether we're going to have to wear masks the rest of our lives, which, thank God, in my instance, is going to be very long, I don't think. But we have to wear a lot of masks. Or, you know, do whatever it is if we have to continue to wash our hands a hundred times a day and, and do whatever it is we have to do. I don't know. What I do know is how we respond to all that is what's going to make the difference in our lives. You all know me. I'm, I'm not a big fan of these masks. They drive me crazy, and by the way, I don't have mine on because I'm not uh, near anybody, close enough. But I don't have it on, but you know I keep it on, I know I try to, you know I'm trying to set the example here. I don't, I'm going to have the thinnest, by the time I, I pass away, I'm going to have, if this keeps up, I'm going to have the thinnest, from here down, it's going to be so thin, the rest of my head's going to look huge. <laughs> because I like... It's like a sauna in there, and I'm sure most of, you, most of you know what I'm talking about. And no, we don't like it. No, we don't like to have to have to continually disinfect and, and watch where we're going, and, and we can't all eat together necessarily. And we gotta we gotta get up in line in shifts, and we gotta stay spread out, and we can't have tables because we can't be close so to write on. We nobody likes that. I don't like the fact that right now, if I want to walk around, other than the fact that we're filming this thing, if I want to walk around, I got to wear the mask. Because God forbid I had COVID and then you got COVID, how would I feel about that? You know what I'm saying? But that is life. That's what we have to do. So we have to learn how to adapt to that. We have to learn how to deal with that. We have to learn that when we get knocked down, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to stay down or are you going to get up? Are you going to stay down or are you going to get up and refuse to be discouraged? Yes, it's discouraging right now. I've all shared with you. I mean, good, good God, I'm watching bowling, man. I'm watching cornhole tournaments. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And granted, those people are skilled, but... Cornhole is not like, you know, I'm ADD. Cornhole won't cut it. You know? <laughs> it's like, 
Yes! 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 We have to come to a point where we refuse to get discouraged. For example, let me give you, let me, let me talk to you a little bit about a few people in the Bible. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, 28. This is talking about David. You all know David? The guy that slayed Goliath? The little shepherd kid? It says here in Samuel 17, 28, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, now you have to remember, because I gotta give you a little background because some of you may have. This is the same brother or band of brothers, David's brothers, who sold him. Well, first they wanted to kill him. And then they said, hi, you know what, let's get a buck for him instead. So then they dug him out of the hole they put him in, basically. And then sold to a bunch of uh, nomads, gypsies. I mean, I don't know who they were. Whoever they were, but he, they sold him in the, in the... I mean, they basically sold him into slavery. Same guy. Okay? Same dude. And it says, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, talking about the men, the, 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 the army of Jerusalem, that were all cowering down because Goliath was taunting them every day. He burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are, and you are, and how, how conceited you are, and how wicked your heart is. You came down here only to watch the battle. In other words, he came down there to gloat. Keep that in mind. 1 Samuel 17, 38. Same kid. Decided to stand up for himself. Said, I can't believe that this whole army is afraid of that one guy. <laughs> so then Saul, the king, dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. You getting all this? Because it's all going to make sense here in a minute. 1 Samuel 17, 42 through 44. He, talking about King Saul again. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome. And he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by... by <clears throat> excuse me. And the Philistine... Talking about the giant, cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. When I said King Saul, I didn't mean King Saul. Goliath said that to David. My mistake. So Goliath said, looked at David and oversaw him, and 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 really looked at this kid and was appalled that this little runt of a boy compared to him would even have the nerve to tell him he was going to take him down. Even have the nerve to even talk to him. So King Saul, the giant, and the, the whole army, his brother being a spokesman, all basically were getting on David's case. So what did David choose to do? Did David tuck tail and run? No. <clears throat> did he cower? Did he feel sorry for himself? Did he try him to invite the army of, of, of Jerusalem and, and Israel to, to his pity party? No. What he did was he trusted God. Because if you read that whole story, he prayed to God. He knew good and well God told him he could take this guy, told him how to take this guy, actually gave Saul back all the, all the armor, the helmet, and all that stuff, said, yo, bro, I don't need this. That's the new international Brooklyn work. Yo, bro, I don't need this. I got, yeah, I got, I got the scripture of Job. 
I've got this little slingshot and a couple of five little stones. I'm going to take this guy. And basically what he was doing, he was calling, he was, he was tell, I got five stones. He's got five shots of living here because I'm taking him out in at least five. And he trusted God. This is our problem sometimes, guys. We're not trusting God. We are trusting ourselves. We are trusting our circumstances. We are trusting what other people are saying about us, but we're not trusting God. Some 40 years ago when I went for training at Duncan Memorial Camp, I went to my first class on a Monday morning. My wife was able to go to class when we went as a couple for training. When I came out of class, one of the things I told my wife on the way back to our, our little cottage where we were living was this. This is what I want to do. This is what God has just told me I'm going to be doing. Now, in her infinite wisdom, she told me to just be quiet and don't say another word to anybody. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I would start spouting my mouth off and probably get myself in trouble first day in. Okay? So I did keep my mouth shut. But I said that this is what I'm going to do. And I didn't know that it was necessarily going to be at Dunklin'. I didn't know it was going to be on my own. But I knew this is what I was going to do. I knew that day God's calling on my life. My purpose in life. Much like Jonathan, he knew. But I kept my mouth shut. I did what I was supposed to do. I continued to do what God told me to do. I changed the way I looked at life, which was extremely negative, even though I was a Christian. And I began to choose to be victorious. This is what David did. He trusted God. God told him. God said it. He's going to do it. He didn't know how it was going to happen. He didn't know that it was going to hit him in the one spot. He didn't have his helmet, the one bare spot in his helmet. He had no clue how it was going to happen. But he knew that God said, go out there to the big guy, put a rock in that sling, and let it fly, son. And he did just that. Boom! Boom! Round one. The boy, the, the man fell like a stinking oak tree. Because David knew God's voice. David understood it. If you're not sure if you can hear God's voice, then hear this. Read the scriptures. In 1 John 4.4, 4, he tells us, you dear children are from God and have overcome them. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in this world. If you're not sure about yourself, read that scripture, read that promise, and stick to it. You dear children living at fresh start, you are from God. And you have overcome them. Who's them? Them, the world. Them, COVID. Them, the people that have told you you're losers. Them, your own, your own selves. That's who you've overcome. Why? Because the one who is in you, your Savior, Jesus Christ, is greater than the one who is in this world. What have I been trying to tell you guys for the last six months? Trust God. Trust God. Forget Trump. Forget the CDC. Forget all these people I think because nobody knows what we're, what, what we're going through. Nobody's been through it before. We have no clue. Trust God. Amen. Don't trust what you hear all the time because a lot of what you hear is just garbage. A lot of what you hear they put out there is, is facts and it's not facts at all. It's just opinion that somebody has. Trust God. Philippians 1.6 Being confident of this, that He who began a work in you will carry it on to completion until 
the day of Jesus Christ. If you're not sure about God, if you're not sure about, about if He's for you or against you, start with those two scriptures. Get those down into your spirit. And then when you're done with that, start looking up more scriptures and researching. I'm, I'm going to tell you, you're going to find a boatload of scriptures that say the same thing. We've got to understand, people, life is not tunnel vision. And sometimes we go through life like, this, like it's tunnel vision. Like, like we have blinders on and we can't see on either side. We can only see up front. And what's up front is, I'm a loser. What's up front of us is, I'll never make it. What's up front of us is, you can't make it. I was sharing with, with someone today, I was in ninth grade, I'll never forget this, I was in ninth grade, a bunch of kids, a bunch of my classmates skipped out, I also skipped school that day, I was not with them, I didn't know what they were doing, I was doing my own thing, they did something totally ridiculous. I come back to school the next day. And I hear over the Joseph Cordovano come to the dean's office. Well, I've been to the dean's office plenty of times, so I already knew that trip. I knew it was going down. I just, I just didn't. I figured, well, I got caught for cutting out of school. They didn't actually catch me. They did catch about 12 of the 15 or 20 people that were all at this one house having a party all day drinking this kid's dad's booze, watching a certain uh, film footage, we'll leave it at that, <laughs> which I wasn't part of. And they just took it for granted that I must have been part of that, so they called me in, because some of them got away. So they figured I was, which I kind of got, you know, I was kind of like proud, but I think I was smart enough that I got away. That's pretty cool. But, uh, you know, anyway. So he calls me in there and, and you know he wants to know the names of the other guys. I'll let you I'll let you have a pass. You won't have to get you won't get in trouble. Blah 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 blah. Okay, listen, dude. I don't know what you're talking about. I have no clue. I mean honestly, this time I really didn't. I have no clue what you're talking about. I don't know who you're talking about. All I know is yes, I, I cut out of school. I was they were at one place, I guess you're saying. I was 15 miles away at a mall. Had nothing to do with it. And he said to me, you will not walk back into the school without your father. And he also said at that point in time, I am sick and tired of your mafia tactics. <laughs> I said, well, okay. So I went home. Dad finally got home. I waited up for him. I said, listen, Dad. I said, I, we got a little problem. Yeah. I said, the problem is I can't go back to school without you. Obviously, his first question was, what do you need me for? I said, well, I kind of cut out of school yesterday. He said, where'd you go? I said, honestly, I went window shopping for clothes. I wanted to see what... Alfred's I was going to get for the summertime, which he totally believed because he knew me. Those of you that know me, you know I got about 50 pairs of shoes. I mean, I'm just, that's, that's me. Okay? So he believed it, and he, he said, did you do anything other than that wrong? I said, I didn't do a thing. He said, get in trouble with the police? No. Get in trouble? No. Get, no, 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 no. All right, we'll go to school. I said, no, by the way, when you get there, I just want you to know, the dean said that he was sick and tired of my mafia tactics. Oh, boy, there it is. Oh, <laughs> my dad want to go to school. My dad said, "Don't worry, we'll go to school. You'll drive. You'll drive to school with me. We'll go together." We went in this little room. I don't know how how it is down here, but in my school, my middle school, like, well, we didn't call it middle school back then, but junior high, there was a room maybe uh, 
not even eight by ten, you know, was stuck with a secretary, a desk, two chairs. That's all the room was. Me and my dad walked in. The dean was behind the door. We walked in. The woman says, "What do you want?" This poor little old woman. She says, "What do you want? What do you do?" We told her what, the, and the dean comes out. I get up to walk in the office with my dad. Dean says, "No, you stay here. I want to talk to your father." Okie dokie. <laughs> So I sit back down, I'm facing, facing this poor little woman, and the next thing I hear is my dad confronting him at the top of his lungs because he has just made a innuendo that as Italian, American Italians, we operate a certain way. Now whether we do or not has nothing to do with it. He made the innuendo. My father got highly insulted. Mr. Vort, no, I won't say his name. The dean came out. <laughs> My luck, he'll probably see this. one of his grandkids will see this like it's soon. The dean came out, <coughs> told me I could immediately go right back to class. Don't worry about it. My <coughs> dad went about his business. All my life, I've been called a loser. All my teenage years. I've been called a loser. And I've got to tell you the truth. I, I, I basically gave up and started acting like a loser. So I kind of played into what, they, what I was buying into. What I'm getting at is you can't, you can't listen to what the world is saying about you. You can only listen to what God is saying about you. And nowhere in the Bible does God say you're a loser. And nowhere in the Bible does it say he created you to be, to be a, a drug addict or an alcoholic or addicted to certain things. He, there's nowhere in the Bible, no one can show me that that's in the Bible, because it's not there. What he does say is, we are children of the Most High God. We will sit at the right hand of, the, of, of, of Jesus Christ. That, we, that even Satan is underneath our feet. Those kind of things he says. That we're victorious. We're blessed. We're loved. But unfortunately, we've heard the world tell us we're a bunch of losers for so long that we can't get past that part of our lives. We can't get past the fact that we've been, we've been operating like a bunch of ragtag lunatics for years. We can't get past the fact that we don't know what to do when, when, when we are actually are successful in our lives, and then we go ahead and sabotage the whole thing because we don't know how to handle that. But when God blesses us and we don't know how to handle it, so we inadvertently, most of the time, subconsciously, sabotage it. For in one shape, form, or another. But the Word says that being confident of this, that He who began a work in you will carry it on to completion until the day Christ Jesus. In other words, until Christ comes back, He said you're a winner, you're a winner. You can take that one to the bank. The only problem is, you've got to start telling yourself you're a winner. Amen. You've got to start being more positive. Life is not tunnel vision. You have choices, and our choices, believe it or not, are unlimited. I know that many of you, well, you know, I was born this, or, you know, my dad was this, so I got to be this. I was, I was raised this way, so I got to, no, that's not necessarily so, man. You got all kinds of choices you can make on your own for yourself. The problem is, we are lazy. And those of us that are lazy don't like to make choices on our own because that takes work. So we would rather succumb to what the masses say about us than to do what we know God says about us. <clears throat> You've got to ask yourself tonight, am I willing to consider other choices? Because that's the first thing you're going to have to come to, come to grip with. Either you're going to stay stuck in what everybody has told you you are, 
And that's basically, for lack of other words, a loser. Or are you going to get up and are you going to fight? Are you going to consider that there just might be some other choices for you out there? And I don't care how young you are or how old you are, it's all the same thing. We all have choices. <clears throat> are you going to listen to what others' opinion, others' opinions of you? That's what they're saying. Are you going to allow that to matter to you, or are you going to allow what really matters, and that's God's word and what He says about you? We've got to start taking action, gentlemen. We've got to take action. And the first thing we have to do is we have to change our thinking. Instead of I have to, use the words I've decided to. We've all said it. Oh, I have to do this. I have to do that. How about, no, you know what? I thought this through and I decide to do it this way. You say, that's crazy, Pastor Joe. What's you know, changing a couple of words going to do? You'd be surprised what it's going to do. A lot. Then the next thing we have to do is we got to learn to relax. No, seriously. And I don't mean like relaxing necessarily physically, which that too, but, but we have to learn how to relax mentally. See, half of our problem is we think too much. We don't ever take time off. Amen. You know, that's why we're, we're, we're so big on, 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 you know, kind of slowing things down around here the best we can. You know, Sundays, oh my God, Sundays are so boring. Yeah, you know what? Learn to chill out, man. Go play volleyball. Play whatever it is you play. I know you got the cornhole thing going on. Have a tournament. I don't know. You know, forget about your addiction. You're safe. You don't have to worry about if you're going to use or not today on a Sunday here at Fresh Start. You're safe. You know, when churches open up, go to church. Why? Church is a pretty safe place. There's very few drug dealers I know that are dealing out of the church pews. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, oh my God, I wonder if it's going to... No, probably not. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, and, and I know that sounds crazy, but but the bottom line is, take a take some time off mentally, even from your recovery of, of worrying about your recovery. Take some time. You got to take some time off. You got to chill out, man. Or else you're going to drive yourself slap crazy. Or crazy than you already are. Depending on the person. But you see what I'm saying? Stop using external stimulants and depressants. Start learning how to internalize and, and relax internally instead of taking a pill or, or, or you know, doing, you know. And again, don't get me wrong, you know, you want to do yoga, do yoga, you know, do the... Do the dog thing or whatever it is. I don't, you know, whatever it is. You, that's that's all well and good, and I understand that. But the bottom line is, you can't always do. You're not always going to have. If you let me back up. If you learn how to relax mentally and physically, especially mentally, guess what? You can actually relax mentally while you're on the job. I mean, as far as thinking about, am I going to am I going to make it? What am I going to do? Blah blah blah. Will I, will I be able to get, you know, go to Sober City? Am I going to be able to get my own apartment? But then all because it all has to do with recovery. Take a, takes a few minutes off, man. Do something. People ask me all the time, you know, at your age, why are you still going to the gym? Because that's where I take off mentally. I go there and I think of nothing. I don't care about anybody else there. If it was up to me, they could have opened the gym up just for me. I don't care how many people are in there or not in there. I don't care what they look like, what their shapes are, how young or old they are. I don't care. I care about one thing. I stick in the Christian music. Boop. I blast it as loud as I can between my, my head. And I pump out the reps I have to pump out. I get done, go in the massage chair, go home. Now I'm relaxed. I haven't thought of you. 
I haven't thought of Fresh Start. I haven't thought of Pastor Tim or anybody else in that hour. I thought about one person and one person only, me. Amen. Because I've just spent eight hours, well, not eight hours anymore, probably more like five or six hours thinking about y'all and what's going on with y'all. And I'm serious. I know that's, well, that's pretty, you know, you don't care about it. No, I care very much about you. But unless I'm healthy, you'll never be healthy. So i got to keep me healthy. So basically we have to start taking affirmative action. Sound like I'm running for president now. And we have to come up with an affirmative model. And it just so happens, uh, wait, but wait, there's more. <laughs> I have that model. It's called Action TNT. I don't have a, the one time I want to run on the board, there's nothing to write there. Don't worry about it, I don't need it. Action TNT. What that stands for is action today, not tomorrow. <laughs> ah, like action really? today, we may start saying that now. Action uh, today, you know, not, not tomorrow. tomorrow. In other words, take action today. Well, I don't know, man, you know, I'm busy. I got, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll relax tomorrow. No, relax right now. Take 5, 10, 15 minutes. Chill out and see what you got to go do. But we've got to learn how to, how to, how to take some kind of affirmative action. We've got to dedicate, dedicate ourselves to giving our maximum effort into everything that we do. And part of what we need to do is learn how to relax. Part of what we need to do is, is to learn that, we, that what God says about us, we really are. And the only way you're going to learn that is by reading the Word, is by getting close to God, is by understanding what He's saying, is by hearing the testimony of the saints who have been before you, that have told you, chill out, man. Let God do His work. He will do it. It may not be in our time frame, but He will do it. Invest in your knowledge and your skill development. Because only you can, you can excel in those areas. If you don't, if you want, if you want, if you don't want to be smarter or better in an area, invest in yourself, man. Stop waiting for somebody else to do. Well, I'll just do my job and just mundane, mundanely do it until the boss recognizes it and gives me a raise. Good stinking luck on that one. You know? No, man. Go find out what your boss is looking for and then go learn how to do it. I'll be honest with you, I was at Dublin. My first, again, again, going back to my first day, first thing they did was they put me out because it was mostly agricultural. And Dublin, if you don't know, was in the middle of Okeechobee, in the middle of cow pasture. 160 acres of swamp is basically what it is. I can't even tell you how hot it is down there. There are no words to describe how hot and humid Dunklin is. And on top of that, the mosquitoes, I found out, had their own landing strip. <laughs> That's how big they were. <laughs> they could suck a pint out of you in no time flat. I figured out what does Dunklin need? Dunklin needs an assistant cook. Because the guy that they got is a little too busy, he needs help. So I began to make sure that people understood that I knew how to cook, and I really did. They said, great. I walked into the kitchen, I reported to the cook, he said, good. See all them pots? There was about 30 pots. You see all them pots? I says, yeah. He says, that's your job. Start washing. And as I'm washing, he's dirty in more pots. <laughs> I did that for weeks. I'm, not only am I washing, I'm, everybody that didn't get the, the, the grime off before, I'm going to make sure it gets off. And finally, what happened was they gave me the kitchen. You know why I wanted the kitchen to run? Because the kitchen 
was air conditioned. <laughs> the kitchen had a roof on it, and we weren't outside in the scorching heat. The boy's not dumb. <laughs> Trust me on this one. <laughs> yep. But in order to get there, I had to take some affirmative action. I had to, number one, let people know because nobody knew me. Hey, by the way, I can cook. If you ever need help, just let me know. I would be more than happy to serve. Great. Wash pots. Great. You know what? Still inside, still doing good. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> Not out there in the hot sun. Got it. But you see what I'm saying? <coughs> God told me I was going to have my own, I was going to do this for, for my ministry. I believed him, and then I began to take steps not only to learn where I was supposed to learn while I was there, but I took extra steps to learn extra stuff on my own about addiction. Not just anybody's addiction, but about my addiction. About why I do things the way I do. And in doing that, I learned that most of us are the same animal. We're cut out of the same cookie dough. There ain't five cents worth the difference between the best of us and the worst of us. Which tells me we all have the same problem. So I was, I was learning about my own addiction, I learned about your addiction. I'll be honest with you, I've never done heroin, I've never done cocaine, nothing. Pothead all the way, pothead and pills, man. Give me pot, pills, and some booze, and I'm good to go. I have no idea what it feels like to be a heroin addict. Don't know. Don't need to know. You know why? Because I know what it feels like to be a food addict. And it's the same, it's the same exactly the same characteristics. Only the only problem is, you hardly ever see anybody getting busted for having a Big Mac stuffed in their face. <laughs> <laughs> but if you had an open container, you could probably get busted. You see what I'm saying? There's no difference. Take affirmative action. Invest in your own knowledge and your own skill development. Because in conclusion, what, I'm, what I guess what I've been trying to say is, is really this, is losers say, I can't and I don't know why I'm the way I am. I can't understand why life did this to me. So you still haven't taken responsibility for your own actions. Life didn't do this to you. You ended up doing this to you. And once you understand that you ended up doing this to you, then you can start talking like a winner. Because a winner accepts responsibility for his choices in life. As I said in the beginning, a winner says, I can change my life. A winner says, I will change my circumstances. See, that's, how, that's the difference between winners and losers. Losers say, I can't and I won't, or I don't know. That's laziness. That's because you don't want to. You don't want to research and do the work and to find out why you did the things you did. You want somebody else to do the work for you. And I know that because I used to be that guy. Let somebody else do the work. Tell me what's wrong with me. Doesn't work that way. You need to find out what's wrong with you so you alone can fix it. You and God and get it fixed once and for all. It doesn't make any difference if I call you a winner or a loser. That doesn't make you a winner or a loser. What makes you a winner or a loser is your attitude towards your recovery and towards your life. Amen. Let's pray.